right, well, thank you, Paul, Charles. Um, you know, if you count your blessings, I use that idea a lot in counseling. Anybody that's down, all you have to do is start listing your blessings, and you'll, you'll be looking up pretty soon. All right, let's look, go ahead and turn into Colossians. This is our third installment in the book of Colossians in regards to how should I pray for believers. Remember, we started the, the, the first two of four requests that Paul would make in his prayer for the Colossians in Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 through 14. We're going to finish the last two. Let's read it, and we'll do a quick review, and then we're going to finish the last two prayer requests in that set of verses here. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 9, and remember in verses 3 through 8, he is thanking, he's finishing um, his thanksgiving for the, the saints there in Colossae. He's received a, uh, a notice from Pastor Epaphras about the dangers going on in there with false teachers at, at the church at Colossae. And uh, he finishes his thanksgiving in verse 8. And now he's going to pray or declare unto them how he has prayed for them. Verse 9 through 14. Uh, for this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So there are four prayer requests that he prays for in this section of verses. Last week we covered the first one, which was spiritual intelligence. In other words, being increased in the knowledge of his will and his word. And then it was a worthy walk, or we would say a fruitful walk. So a spiritually intelligent walk, he's praying, them for, praying for them, and a spirit, spiritually uh, worthy or fruitful walk. Okay, and now we're going to look at the verses, uh, focus on verse 11. And if you remember, I started last week in, in regards to if you ever have somebody on your mind, the Spirit of God prompts someone, prompts you to pray for someone on your mind, what do you pray for them? You can pray for these prayers right here, that they would have an uh, increase in the knowledge of God's will, that they would walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. Those are the first two requests. And then the third request not only a spiritually intelligent walk, uh, a spiritually uh, worthy or fruitful walk, and now we're going to look at a spiritually powerful walk. In verse 11, in verse 11, he, he, he prays here. Let me just repeat it. He says that you be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power and all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. So the next tier of prayers is in regards to spiritually powerful walk, that they would be strengthened with all might, a powerful Christian walk here. Uh, they'd be strengthened according to his glorious power. And so far, this is what we see. He says, basically, let's, let's pray that you be filled with the knowledge of God's will, spiritually intelligent. We'll pray that you be fruitful, that you might walk worthily. And now he's essentially saying, from moving from filled, fruitful, now to a fortified walk, a strengthened walk, a powerful Christian testimony, a powerful Christian walk, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power. Uh, if you've lived long enough, you know that the, the Christian life requires something more than human energy to live. You cannot do it in the, in the strength of your flesh. You can, but what will happen is this. You'll get ornery, grouchy, and you'll snap at people. Because that, that's what happens, at least with me, when I start living in the flesh. We need supernatural strength. We need the power of God. Now, Paul desires here that believers might know this power. And that's why we sung it today. I sing the, mower, uh, the mighty power of God. What did the mighty power of God do in the song that we sung just a couple minutes ago? That caused the... You don't remember? <laughs> I don't remember either, no. Uh, it, it caused the earth to... Okay, let's, let's sing the first part of the hymn again. Ready? I sing the mighty power of God, there it is, that made the mountains rise. 
that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. So this powerful creation, okay, and then I sing the wisdom that ordained. That, that has to go back two verses, right? The first, first prayer request of Paul, that you might know who God is, be filled with the knowledge of his, his word and his will. All these things, uh, Paul is praying and saying, look, you've got to have this power, and this power comes according to his glorious power. Not out of his glorious power, but according to. You plug in, and it never, never diminishes, right? It's according to his glorious power. Give me some, um, you know, let's, let's, let's stir your, your, your thinking here. Give me some of the powerful displays of God from either Old or New Testament. What power has the parting of the Red Sea? So over a natural, natural uh, phenomena, right? Parting of the Red Sea. What else? Okay, provision. Man in the wilderness. Okay, you've topped off. Anybody else? <laughs> Angela. Yeah, that is, that's very powerful. Right, so, Wow. Right? I mean, the other side of the world is in darkness abnormally, right? So that's, that, that had to happen. So he, he was able to, to stop the, 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 sun, the sun from going down. Yes, Charles. Okay. His power displayed uh, in his symbolic presence with the, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Okay. Anybody else? Just think of all these displays of power. Yes, Al. Okay, Joshua, uh, and, 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 and walking around uh, Jericho, right? Yes? The flood, cleansing the earth of violent men, right? Destroying all men except Noah and uh, seven other souls. Yes, Chick? Yeah, man, yeah, man in the wilderness, yeah, okay. Angie? The plagues, absolutely. There's a God for each one of those plagues, and the power was displayed that Jehovah God is greater than all the gods of Egypt. So all of these displays of power, I think, are still, even the power of creation, right? He spoke and it came to be. Um, the power that is magnified, you know, the Jews look back, and they look back at the power of God displayed in, in, in their deliverance from slavery in Egypt, right? All the plagues, all the miracles associated with uh, that new nation coming out of Egypt into the promised land. And the Jews are always said, look back, look back, look what God has done, look what God has done to this great display of power, right? You know what Christians look back at? That, at? They look back at an empty tomb. It's the power of the resurrection. And so Paul is praying that you might know the glory and the power according to his glorious power. What glorious power? That caused Christ to rise from the dead. Now that's power. It's never happened before. Not like that. Okay? He was the first among the brethren to receive that glorious uh, uh, resurrection. Now, um, there is a reason, though, why we have, he's praying for this power. Right after he says this in verse 11a, we see in the second part of this verse, with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness. All these displays of power that we think of that God has displayed in the Bible, and especially in the New Testament with the resurrection of Christ from the dead, Paul is desiring this prayer that we might know this power, and he's desiring that uh, that we might know this power, not that we might cast out demons, not that we might um, raise people from the dead, not that we might do some spectacular, powerful Christian demonstration of sensational power coming from God. He didn't say any of that, but this is why. I pray that you might know his power in order for you to do this. And this isn't glorious, but this is why he prays for this power. Look what it comes after that. Undo all patience. This power, this glorious, from this glorious power, leads to living with patience and long-suffering, depending on whatever the trial is, and being in the trial, and being joyful in the trial. That's 
where this power that is prayed for leads to. Patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. I mean, wow. A child of God suffering patiently and thanking God in the midst of the trial is the prayer for power. Valerie. When I think of Paul and Silas, absolutely right. They could be looking in the mud puddle, but they look up and they sing. And that's, that's a great example of this. Through the trial, what did he have? He had patience and long-suffering. And when the, the fetters and the chains were broken while in prison there, they don't run. In fact, they stay and what is the, eventually, you know, the, the Philippian jailer, he's ready to, you know, Harry Carey, he's going to kill himself, right? But stop, don't hurt yourself, we're still here. And then what, is the, what does the Philippian jailer say? Hardly something that you'll ever hear from a person. What must I do to be saved, right? Um, but see where that power, to be able to, to be thankful in trial is displayed in your life and somebody else sees it and says, wow, what do you have that I don't? And perhaps maybe saying, I want what you have, or in other words, what must I do to have what you have? What must I do to be saved? So this glorious power leads to this long-suffering and patience. And the idea of, of this power demonstrated in patience, the, the, the word patience has to do with um, your patience and long-suffering has to do with your attitude going through the trial, like Paul and Silas in prison after being beaten unjustly. Um, patience looks at the difficult circumstances. It refers to the difficult cir circumstances. Long-suffering looks at enduring difficult people. And so he prays that Christians would, would have this glorious power in order to be patient and long-suffering with thanksgiving, with joyfulness in trials. Uh, let me give you just a, a, a World War II or a little bit after World War II illustration of what Paul's essentially asking for. He's asking for the Christians to have a never give up, never give in attitude in trial. Patient endurance and long suffering through the trial. Um, Winston Churchill perhaps uh, said that, had the shortest speech ever. He was asked to go back to his home college, alma mater in Harrow in England. And uh, this, uh, you know, if you remember, he led Britain through their darkest and their finest hours during World War II. And when this five foot, five inch bulldog of a man took the platform to speak to, uh, to students at his alma mater, they waited breath breathlessly upon his words and they would never forget what they heard. Perhaps the shortest speech ever. He said, young gentlemen, never give up, never give up, never give up. Never, never, never. And with that, he sat down. That was his speech to his alma mater. But that's the idea here, that you grow in God's glorious power, understanding and experiencing that power, that you never give up, and then you endure the trial with patience with, patience with the circumstances and long-suffering with the difficult people in the meantime, right, with joyfulness. That's the idea here. And that type of joyfulness in trial and in suffering, um, while having kindness to others, that's going to require the supernatural strength and power of God. Because that you don't see the natural man displaying. This requires the supernatural power of God. Now, again, you have to have the, the idea of this. Uh, God's power is going to be required for you to live patiently without complaining in your circumstances and without retaliating against people who are difficult. That's the power that he prays that Christians have because what's happening at the Church of Colossae is that there's false teachers there saying, Jesus isn't enough. You'll need some of what we have. If you had some of what we have, then you wouldn't be going through the trials that you have. 
And so Jesus, Paul is praying here that you know the power of God, that you might go through the trial with patience and long suffering, with joyfulness. Um, here's a good example, right? Old Testament. Moses, imagine the, the circumstance in the battle between him and Pharaoh. Right? Let my people go. Okay, they can go. No, they can't go. Yes, you can't. Okay, this is going to happen. No, this is going to happen. No, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. This is gonna... So he had long suffering with a difficult person. But in the wilderness, he was impatient with his own people. And God punished him by not allowing him to go into the promised land. So we're going to need the power of God. In fact, uh, the principle is found in Proverbs 25, 28 that will help us understand this prayer request. It's this. He that has no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. In other words, he's praying that they would be controlled, spirit-controlled in their spirit in times of trouble, in times of trial, that they might display the power of God in being joyful through the trial being thankful to God in the trial, and being kind to others in the trial. So this is going to require supernatural strength. And so a person who has endurance in difficulties and patience with people, that person is walking worthy of the Lord. That person is displaying and exhibiting the power of God in their lives. Again, it's not sensational. It's just plain, you know, Rubber meets the road practical and demonstrated in everyday living. All right, so that's the, those three prayer requests, prayer requests. A spiritually intelligent walk, a spiritually worthy or a fruitful walk, and a spiritually powerful walk. Now let's look at the next verse, or verse 12, the fourth element of his fourfold prayer request for the Colossians. We see in verse 12, it says, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So the fourth request is that they have a spiritually thankful walk. This is, he's praying for them to, he's not being thankful, he's praying for them to be thankful. Okay, according to the, the plural verb in the Greek there, he says, giving thanks unto the Father. That's them giving thanks unto the Father that they might never fail to express their their gratitude for God the Father, where it says, who's made us meet. It's, he's made us qualified. He's made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. You know, as sons of Adams, we could not en enter into the kingdom of God. As sons of God, we can't, because God has made us fit. Unsaved people would not enjoy it. They could not endure uh, being in the kingdom of God, ta being taken up to heaven because they have not been made fit. They haven't been qualified. The only thing that qualifies a person to be allowed into the kingdom of God is through the blood of a son. And so our title to glory is found in the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing can improve on that. Not even a long life of obedience after salvation. At the moment of salvation, a person is right there is made fit. He's qualified to be in heaven. And so that's one of the reasons that you give thanks that God has made you fit to be, in, to be in heaven, fit to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. And what, so let's look at the reasons again, and back in verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet, he's made us fit to be partakers in the inheritance of the saints in light. And now the next part of verse 12 and 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. So here's the picture. Why else should we be thankful? He's made us fit to be in heaven. He's, he's delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us, has moved us, has transported us into the kingdom of his dear son. And another reason why we should be thankful, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So redemption. The idea here is that we've been bought from the slave market of sin. And what was the price? Heaven paid the price with Calvary's blood, right? We're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. And so many things to be thankful for. Let's, re let's remind ourselves what we need to be thankful for. God has made us fit. He has translated us. He's taken us out of this kingdom and, and put us into this kingdom, the kingdom of God's dear son. If you think about it, um, think of all the things that happen at salvation. 
uh, I'll give you a couple, and I'm going to ask you to give me some, right? Uh, Biblically speaking, the unsaved, when we are in in an unsaved state, we were guilty, right? But in a saved state, we are forgiven. In an unsaved state, we were dead in sin, but in a saved state, we've been made alive unto God. Okay? Think of some of the other contrasts that we have given to us in the New Testament in regards to our position and standing before God. Can you think of any? We've been, yes? Okay, so, so children of wrath, now children of obedience. Um, anybody else? Yes, Charles. Condemnation and now no condemnation. Okay, that's good. All right. Yes. Yes, walked in darkness, now we're in the light. In fact, uh, the, the verse says he's translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Um, here's, here's a few others. Uh, we were enemies of God, and now we've been made the friends of God, the family of God, right? So many things happen when it says here we've been translated from the kingdom of, or in the power of darkness to the kingdom of God's dear son. Many things we can be thankful for. And so let me just review here. How should we pray tonight for our church? For spiritually, spiritually intelligent walk. In other words, growing in the knowledge and the will of God. A spiritually worthy walk, being fruitful unto every good work. A fruitful walk, a worthy walk. A powerful walk, that we would have the power of God to endure the trials of life with joyfulness. And lastly, a thankful walk. Joy and thanksgiving in a, in, in a Christian life that uh, is going to be challenging. So those four requests, right? Let's think of those today as we pray this evening. Um, let me give you an update about where...